I was asked to preach back on the, the second this year, the first Sunday of this of 2022. Yeah. <laughs> I gave the the first half of a sermon on Hebrews chapter one about the different Christ identifiers in that chapter, and I'm gonna tonight. Uh, bring the second part of that. So our 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 text is gonna be in Hebrews chapter one. If you want to turn there, um, what I am gonna read now is in our our main text. But this is just a refresh on last time. So um, I said, or it says. God, who at sundry times and diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things at the word of his power, when he had by himself heard our sins, sat down on the right hand of majesty and high. So that's what I read last time, and when I read again, we'll start at verse 4 of that chapter. But um, I, I originally said there were 15 distinct Christ identifiers and in those three verses there were seven and I was going to go through the rest of the eight uh, tonight but I lied to you all because there are only 13 in in the rest of the chapter. I, I got kind of confused because a lot of the points as we'll see when I read, repeat from the last uh, sermon. So if you haven't heard or listened to the last one, the first part of this, uh, Lyle posts the YouTube videos on our church's YouTube, so you can go there and check it out. So Hebrews chapter 1 verse 4 says, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Of course, we see here that he is a Jesus, God's son, is better than the angels, and he even obtains a more excellent name than they. Verse 5, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So this is where the repetition starts. Repeating from last time, we see that this, this figure is God's son. And repeating that, again repeating that he's better than the angels. Verse, next verse. Again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. So here in, in verses 6 and 7, we see that the angels worship him. So that's adding another letter, another um, another piece to him being more, him being better than the angels, another piece of evidence because the angels worship him. Verse 8, we see, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne of God, is forever and ever. 
The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So there we we see that Jesus is everlasting. And then we see that the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of his kingdom. And I'll, I'll get as we go more into what that means. Verse 9. There was love, righteousness, and hate iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So we see here that Jesus loves righteousness, he hates iniquity, and he has God's gladness above everybody else. Next we see and thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. So here, verse ten, we see that he was that God's son was always there. He even laid the foundation of the earth and of the heavens. So he he is always there. Verse 11, they shall perish, they shall perish, but thou remainest, and they also wax old as doth a garment. So this kind of goes with the, the last verse. The 10, 11, and 12, they all kind of follow the same thought. Here it says that all of us will perish or grow old, but God's Son is going to remain. Verse 12, And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. So in addition to earlier talking about how Jesus is everlasting, we see that he's also unchanging. And verse 13, But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So again, this repeats from the last message that Jesus sits on God's right hand you see that again, and also repeats that he's once again better than the angels. And then uh, verse 14, it really goes with chapter 2, it, it bleeds directly into chapter 2. So we'll just be talking about the verses 4 to 13 tonight. First off, Jesus is better than the angels. Verse 4 makes direct reference to the superiority of Jesus. In, in previous verses, the writer of Hebrews, who, when I was a kid, I always thought that it was an open and shut case that Paul wrote Hebrews. But as I studied more, it's, it's, uh, less and less clear. It's, uh, it would make a lot of sense for Paul to write Hebrews, but he didn't absolutely write Hebrews, so it's a little mystery for, for all of you. But the writer of Hebrews explained that God's message to mankind is now be given through Jesus, through his Son. In, in times past, his messages were given by prophets, but now it's given through Jesus. Since Christ is the exact imprint of the nature of God, he is the ultimate authority figure. These verses also remind the reader that Jesus is the creator. He's not a created being, as I believe I covered in the, the first part. This, because he's 
the creator and not created. This makes him superior to all other things, including the angels. They, we even see that in verse uh, 5, I think, I probably shouldn't have put it away, but we see that the, the angels even worship him. Worship of angels and other spiritual beings in, in the time when this letter was written wasn't uncommon. Part of the point of verse 4 is that Jesus is not on the same level as these beings. People in, in that day and age would worship these angels and this is pointing out that Jesus is far, far above angels to the point where they even worship him. Even if an angel were to appear and give a different message than that of Christ, um, Christ would still be the supreme authority. We also see that Jesus um, Another part of his, his being better than the angels is that he has inherited a more excellent name. And the name of Jesus in this context has more to do with status and reputation than just a, a personal label. It's sort of like a, a job title, like a uh, position that he has. Jesus' position as divine, his role as creator, and his work in reconciling God and man make him more excellent than any other conceivable spiritual being. As a man, Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. With his death, resurrection, and ascension, however, he inherits a better name or position than they do. He inherits this, this because uh, the position is rightfully his. He created everything, so he deserves a uh, a better title than the angels do. He's seated at the right hand of God, which we not only read in the, the first few verses, but then see again here. He's seated at the right hand of majesty and high. He is not devoted to the angelic position of service. Not only is Jesus better than the angels, even his name is better than the angels. Verses 1 through 4 describe Jesus as above any angel, both in power and authority. Starting in verse 5, however, the writer of Hebrews presents a specific, presents specific evidence from the Old Testament that will support this. According to the prophets, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is not some created being or spiritual power. Verse 5 and we just read, refers back to Psalm 2-7, where it says, I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Psalm 2 encourages the people to 
obey God and to follow his chosen leader. Psalm 27, which I just read, specifically implies that this new ruler derives his right to the throne from his relationship to God. It says specifically there that he's God's son. In this day, God, this day, God has begotten him. The writer of Hebrews uses this reference to support his claim that Jesus is an authority far and above any angel, any spiritual being, any, any created power in the world. Jesus is far above it. We continue and read that Jesus is everlasting. We've all heard that Jesus is everlasting, but what does it mean when something is everlasting? This is going to be a quick English one-on-one -on -one with, with Christian right now, with Professor Henry. So I'll teach you a quick trick to finding out what certain words mean. When you break down the word everlasting, you find the words ever and last. So uh, that's what it means. It, it means something to last for, forever. Our text says that God's Son is everlasting. God's Son is always there, and He will always be there. He remains forever. Psalm 145.15 says, Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endure throughout all generations. God's kingdom endures forever, and, and Jesus is seated as the, the ruler of this kingdom. He has dominion over that kingdom that lasts forever. As 1-8 says, the Son also endures forever and ever. I'm repeating myself a little bit. He's from everlasting to everlasting. He even laid the foundation of the earth and of heaven which bleeds directly into our next identifier. I, I kind of bumped this one up a little bit just so it would flow real nice. Jesus is unchanging. Most students of history, which I, I would like to think I'm one of, would probably be familiar with names like Socrates, Plato and Aristotle. And while the ideas of these men continue to be prevalent today, there were several thinkers who developed systems of thought before and after, and after them. Probably one that you're probably less familiar with. Uh, Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle are kind of the, the heavy hitters. But one you might be less familiar with is Heraclitus. Heraclitus is perhaps most famous for the statement, man cannot step into the same river twice. I understand that I probably don't have to explain how water works to all of you, but as water flows, change occurs even if we can't see it or wrap our heads around it. The river banks slowly erodes, the, the, 
the molecules of water advance further down the stream as, as it flows and or if if nothing else you're at least older the next time you step in that river even if it's just by a few seconds that's what Heraclitus means by that statement That's what he's saying there. In this statement, he was simply pointing out that change is a constant for all of us. Things change around us and within us all the time. Sure, the advancements of modern science may tell us that the person's DNA code remains the same throughout their life. But we all know that we change physically, mentally, and, and morally, and even spiritually over time. However, as Hebrews 13.8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus is immutable. It is impossible for his character or being to undergo any mutation or any any change like like we all do. His power cannot be augmented or diminished. He never learns or forgets and it cannot be anything other than perfectly holy. Human beings can change in a multitude of ways. And sure, when Christ became flesh, he went through a, a growth spurt or something, some physical change. But Jesus' character always remains the same. Our, our text even says that all else will perish or grow old. All that, that Jesus laid will waste away. Now, when I was a kid, I thought that mountains lasted forever. I mean, have you ever seen a mountain? They're, they're huge. I, I don't really know how much the average mountain weighs, but I am fairly certain that I couldn't move on. You know, I'm, I'm like, I mean, I've never tried it, so maybe I'd have to try it, but, you know, I'm fairly certain I couldn't move. Sorry, my, my notes got out of order. It's moving mountains is just something that we can't do. Therefore, my my five year old mind or however old there was thought they couldn't change. They must not change because we can't influence them. They're they're kind of permanent fixtures, I thought. As we grow up, however, we learn that mountains do, in fact, change. We learn that the peaks and valleys of the mountain were formed over thousands of years. We learn of things like erosion, which can slowly wear down the mountain. Sure, mountains are around a lot longer than we are, but they aren't eternal. Jesus is eternal. 
mountains will undergo some change. But Jesus is unchangeable. Mountains are going to change, but Jesus remains the same. Psalm 102.27 says, But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. Jesus is a lover of righteousness. Love is intent, intense feeling of deep affection or great interest in something. Love makes you feel. What do you love? Maybe it's a sports team. Like the, I love the Blues and the Cardinals. Maybe it's that, or maybe it's your country. Or maybe it's your favorite food or drink. I, all my friends know I love and an ice cold refreshing duck. But what does Jesus love? Our text tells us here that he loves righteousness. Can't get enough of this stuff. We need to ask ourselves why did Jesus love righteousness? Why did he love it? so heavily like he did. The answer is simple and it's found if we crack open the Bible. Jesus loves his father and his father loves righteousness. Perhaps there's a, a shadow of this in our own family. Of course, it's not completely true for everybody. I, I mean, there are things that I like that my brother Tommy doesn't, or things that Grayson likes that no one else does, you know. <laughs> and, and there are things that our parents like that we don't. But, there are a lot of things that we agree on. We all love the Blues and the, the Cardinals to varying degrees. I, I, for example, I've watched almost every Blues game this year and, and Jen uh, just thinks Ryan O'Reilly is really hot. So, I mean, there are different levels there that we agree on. But this is because we were raised in a household where sports were really important to us. In the same way, Jesus loves righteousness because his Father loves righteousness. Scripture is filled with references to the importance of moral uprightness. This attribute of God is this, and this is a quote. I didn't write down the reference for this quote, so I just want to be completely honest because I'm not coming up with this bit. <laughs> But I have a quote and says, where is the quote? Okay, <laughs> sorry. This aspect of God is essentially the same as his faithfulness or truthfulness, that with that which is consistent with his own nature and promises. So when we think about righteousness, we are considering, we are considering whatever is bright and just and then subtle. What conforms to the revealed will of God? 
what has been appointed by God to be acknowledged or obeyed by man. And the sum total of the requirements of God. To be short and simple, righteousness has to do with right actions which are determined by what God thinks and says. The writer of Hebrews made the righteousness of Christ a major theme in his letter. Although Jesus was tempted in every way that, that we are, he remains sinless. Jesus learned obedience from things which he suffered, and he obeyed perfectly because of his righteousness. Jesus became the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, which means he's the king of righteousness. God swore by himself because he alone is righteous, faithful and true to his word. He loves righteousness. Our greatest need is righteousness if we are to have access to God's throne of grace. We're fun help in time of need. In fact, our our text even says that the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of his kingdom. A scepter of a kingdom was a clear symbol of power and authority, and righteousness is the symbol of this kingdom. Jesus is a hater of iniquity. Not only does God want us to know what he loves, but also wants us to know what he hates. Now, iniquity is an older word. It means immoral or grossly unfair behavior. Jesus hates someone who lives a life immorally or lawlessly. People who live their lives with the attitude of, like, nobody's going to tell me what to do. And I, I'll do what I want. Jesus can't stand that. God reveals his hatred from this behavior in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. And says, Not everyone shall, not everyone saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to that will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. Have we not prophesied in the name, in your name? And in thy name I have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. 
And then will I profess unto them. I never knew you. Depart from me. Ye that work iniquity. God's hatred for disobedience is specially revealed through Jesus' offering on the cross as the only way for God's wrath to be averted. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against against all ungodliness of men and unrighteousness of men who hold, who hold the truth in If we know that God our Father and His Son hate lawlessness, disobedience, and unrighteousness, then shouldn't we hate the same? Shouldn't we make a conscious effort to flee from this, this stuff? Jesus is God's gladness above all else. Like when we uphold the values of our earthly parents, it can make them proud. Standing up for yourself, living your month, living your life morally, or whatever it may be that can make earthly father glad. But what makes God the father glad? Well, the answer is presented when you crack open the Bible. Now, this is just a couple examples here. I know we're running short on time. But God is glad when we do good. James 1.27 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God. And undefiled before God. And the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. God really appreciates it when we go out and do good things for the people around us. There are tons of ways for us to do good works in our community, whether it be volunteering or donating to charity, or even just being a, a good per being a good person and reflecting God. God is also glad when we grow in knowledge of Him. Ephesians 3, 18, 19 says, May be able to 
comprehend with those sayings what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. God wants us to know who he is and what he stands for. Reading and studying scripture is a good way to learn about God and about Jesus. God is glad when we thank him. Psalm 117.1.2 says, I praise the Lord all ye nations, praise him, all ye people for, for his merciful kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. We should express our adoration, approval, thanksgiving, and celebration to the one who created and renamed us. I'm good. <clears throat> How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise Him is Psalm 147 says. These are just uh, a few examples of what makes God's life and Jesus perfect. and Jesus perfectly upholds upholds these values and more. To conclude, our study of Hebrews chapter 1 is taught us that Jesus is God's Son, He is the heir of all things, the maker of the years, the brightness of God's glory. And the express image of it. And the express image of him. Jesus is powerful in his word. He's the purchase of our sins and Thus is seated at God's right hand in glory. He is better than the angels. He is everlasting. He is unchanging. He is a lover of righteousness and a hater of iniquity. He is He is also God's gladness. It's of utmost importance that we know who our Savior is. 